Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu gives us this scenario. He says, Inna al-abda la yahummu bil-amri min at-tijara wal-imara hatta yuyassara lahu that a servant of Allah will be pursuing something of this world of wealth or leadership until it has finally been facilitated for him. So you've made dua for something you've wanted and you've gone after it and now it is on its way to you. And then at that moment, يَنظُرُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ فَيَقُولُ لِلْمَلَائِكَ أَصْرِفُوهُ عَنْ Allah looks at him from above the seven heavens and says to the angels, take it away from him. فَإِنْ يَسَّرْتُهُ لَهُ أَدْخَلْتُهُ النَّارِ Why? Because if I give this to him, then I'm going to put him in hellfire. Meaning this blessing in dunya will change him in a way that Allah knows will end up leading to his destruction in the hereafter. فَيَصْرِفْهُ عَنْهُ So Allah takes it away from him. فَيَضَلُّ يَتَطَيِّرُ يَقُولُ سَبَقَنِي فُلَانَ دَهَانِي فُلَانَ وَمَا هُوَ إِلَّا فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ عَلَيْهِ So he keeps on saying after that, so and so beat me to it. So and so got this and I didn't. And the whole time it was nothing but Allah's blessing upon him. Now on the day of judgment, when things are made open and clear, wouldn't you want to know why certain things were withheld from you? What happens when Allah reminds you as you're standing before him, remember that thing you kept asking me for? Remember that spouse you wanted? Remember that career or position you were after? Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah mentions a powerful narration from al-Tabarani. And while other scholars like Ibn Rajab and Ibn Taymiyyah pointed out weakness in its chain, they still found it relevant to quote for its wisdom. And that is what Anas radiallahu anhu narrated. يَقُولُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ إِنَّ مِنْ عِبَادِي مَنْ لَا يُصْلِحُ إِيمَانَهُ إِلَّا الْفَقْرِ وَإِنْ بَصَطُّ عَلَيْهِ أَفْسَدَهُ ذَلِكَ Allah says that from amongst my servants are those whose faith would not be rectified except through poverty. And if I open the doors of wealth for him, it would corrupt him. وَإِنَّ مِنْ عِبَادِي مَنْ لَا يُصْلِحُ إِيمَانَهُ إِلَّا الْغِنَى وَلَوْ أَفْقَرْتُهُ لَأَفْسَدَهُ ذَلِكَ And there are amongst my servants those whose faith would not be rectified except through wealth. And if I deprived him, it would corrupt him. وَإِنَّ مِنْ عِبَادِي مَنْ لَا يُصْلِحُ إِيمَانَهُ إِلَّا الصِّحَّةِ وَلَوْ أَسْقَمْتُهُ لَأَفْسَدَهُ ذَلِكَ And there are amongst my servants those whose faith would not be rectified except through good health. And if I made him sick, it would corrupt him. وَإِنَّ مِنْ عِبَادِي مَنْ لَا يُصْلِحُ إِيمَانَهُ إِلَّا السَّقْمْ وَلَوْ أَصْحَحْتُهُ لَأَفْسَدَهُ ذَلِكَ And there are those amongst my servants whose faith would not be rectified except through illness. And if I healed him, it would corrupt him. وَإِنَّ مِنْ عِبَادِي مَنْ يَطْلُبُ بَابًا مِنَ الْعِبَادَةِ فَأَكُفُّهُ عَنْهُ لِكَيْ لَا يَدْخُلَهُ الْعُجُبُ And there are amongst my loving servants that seek a particular type of worship, a particular type of station and they're unable to achieve it so that they don't become conceited. <inaudible> I plan for my servants with my knowledge of what is in their hearts. Verily, I am all knowing and I am all aware. This is so crucial to understanding dua in a wholesome way. You're not just calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with certainty in his ability to do things for you, you're calling upon him with certainty in his knowledge to do what's best for you. And just like you're admitting your weakness to do what you want for yourself, you're also acknowledging your limitation of understanding what's actually best for you. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the dua of any one of you is answered as long as he does not pray for something which involves sin or the cutting off of ties of kinship. And as long as he does not become impatient and start to say, دعوت فدعوت. I made dua, I made dua, فلا أرى يستجيب لي. And Allah is not answering my dua. فيدعو الدعاء. And so as a result, what does he do? He stops making dua altogether. Now the effect is that you stop making dua. But your bad opinion of Allah is the source of it in the first place. Because by saying that, you're either attributing to Allah al daaf which is weakness, or you're attributing to him al-bukhul, which is stinginess. And Allah is so far away from either of those attributes. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna Allah Rahimun, Hayyun, Karimun. Verily, Allah is compassionate. Allah is shy. Allah is generous. 
يستحي من عبده أن يرفع إليه يديه ثم لا يضع فيه ما خيرا. He's too shy for his servant to raise his hands up to him and then not place any goodness in either one of them. Subhanallah, our Lord is shy from one of us. Who are you, Ya Rabbi, to be shy from me? We're worried about standing before you. But Allah doesn't disappoint those that he loves. And so every single dua he takes seriously. As Ibn Ata'illah rahimahullah said, Mata atlaq Allahu lisanaka bi talab, fa'lam annahu yuridu an yu'atiyak. Any time that Allah allows your tongue to move, then know that it's because he wants to give you something. And that's why Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu said, when I make dua, I only concern myself with the ability to ask, not the answer. You shouldn't be worried if you're not seeing the answer. You should be worried if you're unable to ask. That's where you should really be afraid. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said something to that effect. He said, Ma akhafu an uhram min al ijaba, walakini akhafu an uhram min al dua. He said, I'm not worried at all about being deprived of an answer. I'm only worried about being deprived from being able to make the ask. Because if you ask Allah, He will answer. So, what are the various ways that Allah gives us when we make dua, especially as it pertains to this moment in the hereafter? For one, in your record on the Day of Judgment, you see all of these salawat and tahleel and tasbih and istighfar of the dua, all the words of remembrance, all the words of forgiveness, all the prayers on the Prophet, all these words of praise are mountains of good now in your record. And you know what? You're likely to be most sincere with those words when you're making a dua in desperation. So that makes it even better. Remember, dua is composed of two things. Thana, which is the praise of Allah, and talab, which is the request from Allah. The scholars say that the thana part, which is the praise that you put forth throughout your dua, it's always stored for the hereafter. As for the talab, which is the request, that part is distributed between both this dunya and the akhirah, this life and the next. So sometimes it's going to be delayed. So the rewards of all the remembrance of Allah that was part of your dua is showing up in your record. And if that was all, that would be sufficient. Then the Prophet ﷺ goes on to say, relating to the talab itself, to the ask itself. He says, there is no Muslim who calls upon Allah so long as it's not a sinful ask or the cutting off of family ties, but that Allah will give him one of three things. Allah might quickly fulfill your ask. Or Allah will divert an evil away from him similar to it. Or Allah will store it for him like a treasure in the hereafter. They said, If that's the case, Ya Rasulullah, we're going to keep on asking. Prophet said, Allahu Akthar, Allah is more. Keep on asking. Allah has even more than what you ask of Him, no matter how much you ask. The point is, every single time you ask Him sincerely, Allah is going to respond with so much more. And so, what is it like when you're standing in front of Allah and Allah says, remember when you asked me for this and that, here's what I've turned that into for you here. Here's the beauty of it that the ulama mentioned. Let's say that you're sick and you and 150 people make dua a bunch of times for you to be cured, but you're not cured in this dunya. Every single one of those duas was accepted for you as a treasure in the hereafter. Now it might be that Allah in His mercy lets the sickness go and then he still cures you at some point. So let's say that 500 du'as were made for a cure. Now 499 of them were stored in the hereafter as treasure. But then that last one went to your cure in this dunya as well. The point is, as you're standing there on the day of judgment and you're seeing these stored treasures of du'as showing up in your books of deeds, let me tell you what you're not doing. You are not wishing that those du'as were answered in this dunya. You're saying, Alhamdulillah, Allah left them for here where they mean so much more. Not like, Ya Allah, can you let me go back and get that job or that spouse or whatever it is that you were asking for? You are wishing at this point that all of your du'as were answered for the hereafter. And so you trust your Lord with your du'as. It's very similar to the way that you trust your Lord with your charity. You loan Him your donations in this world and Allah gives it back to you as what? As a mountain of gold in the hereafter. So how many du'as have you deposited in this dunya and what type of treasures will you see from Allah who never failed to hear you, He never failed to answer you, and He never fails to reward you in ways that you could never imagine. فَأَمَّا مَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ 
فهو في عيشة راضية